This is the unthinkable story of Hawaii Robinson. It's September 16th, 2014, and fall is in full effect as the weather is cold and dreary this time of year in Mobile, Alabama. Eight-year-old Hawaii Robinson would spend her morning and early afternoon attending school as normal. She would leave school and get off the school bus to return home to St. Stephen's Woods Apartments around 3.30 p.m., where her grandmother, Brenda Popolis, would be there to greet her. Upon her arrival, she changed clothes because she'd gotten wet from the rain on the way home, running from the school bus to her door. She then received a phone call from her father, Hawatha Robinson, that lasted 17 minutes. After that call, Hawaii's grandmother, Brenda, said that Hawaii told her she was headed out to meet her father at her older cousin's apartment. This was where he told her over the phone that he was gifting her $150 for her upcoming ninth birthday. This would be the beginning of a hellish nightmare. Around 8 p.m., Hawaii's sister, Janaya, would arrive home from dance practice. Upon arriving, she took notice that Hawaii wasn't there and asked her grandmother where she was. To which Brenda told her that Hawaii had gone to their cousin's house who lived in the same apartment complex. Remarking about how late into the night it was, she told her grandmother that she'd walk around to her cousin's house and bring Hawaii back home. But when she arrived, there was a problem. As she stood on the outside of the apartment and knocked, no one from the other side of the door answered. So she decided to use her cell phone to call her cousin, Kim, to see where she was. And what she heard next would send chills down her spine. Kim answered the phone and told Janaya that she hadn't been home all day. In fact, she was at the hospital. So Janaya placed a call to Hawaii's father, Hawatha, next. But he told her that he hadn't seen Hawaii and that he never made it to their cousin's house. It was at this moment, Janaya told her grandmother, Brenda, to call their mother, Yosha. After explaining to her daughter that they couldn't find Hawaii anywhere, Yosha would immediately leave work and just before 10 p.m., her grandmother would place a call to the police department to report her granddaughter missing. She remarked how the last time she'd seen her granddaughter was when she told her that she was headed to her cousin's house, again in the same apartment complex. After being notified, her father Hawatha would rush over in a fit of rage, distraught, that his little girl was now missing. It is unknown if Hawaii ever made it to her cousin's home, since the police interviewed her cousin and she told them that she wasn't home during the time Hawaii would have come by. Now, with a bolo issued for the young girl and the urgency of her disappearance being a top priority, night would pass, and the very next day, hundreds of people, including local residents, law enforcement, and a foundation called Class Kids would all participate in the hunt for the missing eight-year-old girl. A search grid and canine unit, along with an aerial search, and door-to-door -door inquiries would all be made in an attempt to gather any clues while a vigil memorial would also be held for the missing child and include several flyers offering a $5,000 reward from the family to be issued in her finding. But again, they would ultimately come up empty. Hawaii was nowhere to be found. In an effort to track her movements the afternoon she went missing, the police would also search the immediate areas near her home, including local businesses. This is when they would eventually get a tip of a possible sighting at a nearby gas station convenience store. This tip led them to surveillance footage that would help identify and record her last known whereabouts before her disappearance. At approximately 4 p.m. the day of her being reported missing, a CCTV camera captures Hawaii entering a convenience store. Cameras from inside of the facility would again allow law enforcement to track her every step to provide more insight on anything that may have transpired once she was inside.
Seven minutes was the length of time she spent inside of the store where she would appear on camera standing in line to buy candy and snacks. In the footage, she's seen talking to an older woman standing directly behind her. Whatever words were spoken between the two could not be ascertained in the video. At first, police believe this to be their first clue as the woman seen speaking to Hawaii was considered a person of interest. But as they continued to watch, they would soon abandon this theory. Upon interviewing the store clerk, it was reported that Hawaii purchased $4 worth of candy before leaving the store alone. This recording was shown to Hawaii's mother, Yosha, to see if she recognized the woman standing behind her daughter at the convenience store. And although she didn't recognize the woman, she did remark how Hawaii didn't have any money. So how then did she come up with the $4 to spend on candy at the store? In addition to this, they used surveillance footage from outside of the store to track Hawaii's movements upon leaving and noted that she left the store and turned a corner, disappearing just out of range of the camera. After this, detectives asked the question of how Hawaii got to the convenience store in the first place. Also, it was raining but her clothes weren't wet and she didn't have an umbrella, which caused them to conclude that she hadn't walked there. She was driven. So they continued to investigate the footage further to find any leads that might tip them off in the direction of where to look. As more questions mounted, her parents would appear on camera to voice their concerns and belief that Hawaii, wherever she was, would return home safely. She came home and got out of her damp clothes and, you know, went to, started to watch TV. And her daddy called her and they was talking and she always tell them to bring her some money. And he, he have a niece live over here, so he told her that he was going to come to his niece's house. Full, depressing. I, I haven't ate. I haven't slept. I haven't had nothing but sips of water. I, I have not thought the worst. I've only thought the best. I have my faith in God that she is okay and that she is coming home. And I'm trying to wait patiently as I can. All the negative rumors, all the drama. I don't have it up. I just want my child home. Somebody is saying that she this place, that place, and the other one. We can't find her. The police has been, every, everything, they following up on everything. Everything they are following up on. And like I said, there's a $5,000 reward out for the, say, the, to bring her out home. Anything, anything you think you've seen, any way you thought her, you seen her, please come forward and tell us something. What, 24 hours. It's been been up all night searching. I hadn't had nothing to eat, nothing to drink. I ain't gonna stop until it's over with. Until she come home, until she in my own. That's all I want. That's all I ask for. Have you That's been amazed and surprised at all the support and all the people that have showed up today to walk the streets, hand out flyers, and help look for your daughter? I didn't know we'd get this man. It's a team right here. It's a team. It's a team. It's a team thing. You know. And I'm so And I'm with them. And I'm with them. I'm behind them 100. percent I'm up for the next 24 hours, or how long will it take to I have in my arm, that when I rest. What do you believe happened to her? Do you have any idea? I don't believe nothing happened to her. I believe she out there. You know, she out there. She just, they just need to let her come home. A warning. This next part of the story may be graphic and difficult to listen to in detail, but it's necessary to express the amount of evil and the sadistic nature of man. On September the 18th, just two days after Hawaii Robinson went missing, a city public works employee phoned 911 to report the discovery of a body on Rebel Road. The police were immediately dispatched to the area and were able to confirm that the body was that of the missing young girl, Hawaii Robinson. She was found lying on her back with her right arm bent at the elbow her left arm was at a 45 degree angle and her wrist was on top of a wooden cross that just happened to be mixed in with the debris she was laying on. She was unclothed from the waist down and her Hello Kitty t-shirt was pulled up above her navel. Her right leg was extended outward while her left leg was bent at the knee. The detective on scene recalled her first emotional sighting of the little girl saying, the purple shorts as well as the underwear that she was wearing 
were pulled off the right leg and were just hanging on the left leg basically where the knee is, indicating that a violent assault had taken place. There was also seminal fluid found on her clothing. If that wasn't bad enough, this case gets much worse. As detectives continued to comb over the only surveillance footage they had of her last known whereabouts, they noticed something peculiar in the video footage. Deciding to rewind the footage several minutes back to see if they could see anything of interest, one of the detectives noticed a burgundy Tahoe traveling down the street just before disappearing on the side of the building and put out of frame of the camera. As they continued to watch, however, eight-year-old Hawaii suddenly appeared running from around the corner, the same side of where the burgundy Tahoe had just driven. Now, replaying the footage through to track her movements after exiting the store, they realized that Hawaii left the store and traveled right back around the corner to the side of the building from where she had first emerged. Piecing this together, they now believe they have the answer as to how Hawaii arrived at the convenience store that day. Whoever was behind the wheel of the Burgundy Tahoe was believed to be their latest person of interest. By this time, Hawaii's parents were now making arrangements to bury their daughter, and she was laid to rest just 10 days after her body was found. Back at the police station, detectives had come to a startling realization that turned the entire case on its head. The Burgundy Tahoe looked familiar to them, and it looked familiar to them because Hawaii's father, Hiawatha, had driven a burgundy Tahoe that looked just like the one seen on camera, stopping on the side of the convenience store. Yosha also recalled how during their attempts to meet and make arrangements for Hawaii's funeral, that Hiawatha would arrive in a different vehicle than his burgundy Tahoe, oftentimes being dropped off by a friend. Detectives, now armed with the surveillance footage, set off to confront Hiawatha, where he was staying at his girlfriend's residence. Once there, the girlfriend let them in where they interviewed Hiawatha and asked him why his vehicle was spotted on camera at the convenience store. He responded by denying he was ever in the area. So the detectives pushed further, insisting that they believed it was his vehicle and that he'd been the one who had driven his little girl to the store. But again, Hiawatha claimed it wasn't him. Well, why'd you stop? I know, right? I the, the video, when we look at the front the front of the business and the back of the business, I, I stopped in the business. It, that, that truck, your truck, stops. We see it at 1603 coming this way. And then it doesn't come out the back until 1611, until 411. I'm talking about I couldn't stop. I'm talking about she couldn't have gotten in the truck with me. I'm talking about you can, you can find a pregnant truck. You can do whatever you want to do to this truck, and they're going to show you. She went in the truck with me. And despite their beliefs, detectives had a problem. The video footage wasn't in range to get a clear license plate number to prove their suspicions. With nothing to tie the father to their claims, they decided to leave. But on the way out, one of the detectives spotted something. The home they were standing in had cameras. So they asked Hiawatha's girlfriend if they were working, eager to prove the detectives wrong about her boyfriend. And to help clear his name, she answered yes. Detectives would eventually come back with a search warrant to go over the videotape recordings. This would turn out to produce damning evidence. As detectives rolled back the recorded footage to the day of Hawaii's disappearance, her father, Hawatha, can be seen leaving his girlfriend's home at 3.20 p.m. Already tracking the distance from the girlfriend's house to the convenience store, they knew that this meant Hawatha had more than enough time to cover the distance to pick up his daughter and make it to the store just before 4 p.m. But they kept watching. And at 7.01 p.m., Hiawatha is seen returning to his girlfriend's home. But his actions and movements are disturbing. They watched as he discarded his clothing and can be seen traveling to and from her laundry room. 
And if you're thinking the obvious, you'd be right. He was trying to wash away some type of evidence. With the ominous and disturbing realization now all but clear, detectives confiscated the footage along with Hiawatha's Burgundy Tahoe to be processed. On October 2nd, the SWAT team and local police kicked down Hiawatha's door to execute a search warrant for his home. After the search, a reporter convinces him to speak on camera about the incident. Bust my door up, and I'm talking about, they could have called me. They been calling me. They been calling me to, to open the house up for them and everything. All they had to do was get on the phone, call me or whatever. I would have opened that door up for them. They ain't had to come do what they did. Robinson said he didn't see anything missing from the house when the FBI left. Well, I didn't look around or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I just got the search one that they left or whatever and put it in my pocket or whatever. You know? What did yeah. you say that they took? Did you even read it yet? Uh, I hadn't read it yet. I just took it and folded it up and put it in my pocket. You know? When asked about his daughter, Robinson told me he was tired of the rumors spreading about what happened to Hawaii. There are times, you know, I'm talking about, I'm gonna, I miss all the good times that I, I had with and everything, you know, but I just wish everybody just stopped the lines and all the rumors that they got going around, you know. I'm talking about, I got, a, I got thousands of people standing behind me. I asked how he was coping with the death of his eight-year-old little girl. I'm trying to hold it all together. And if it weren't for my friends and my family or whatever, behind me 100%, I don't know where I, what'll be going on with me, you know. What you've just seen is the cowardly nature of a sadistic pedophile who betrayed the trust of the very person he was supposed to protect. Once processed, the detectives would eventually find all the evidence they needed to prosecute this monster. At the scene of where she was found, detectives discovered two clear beads from her braided hair that would also match one of the clear beads found in the back of Hiawatha's Tahoe, though he claimed she had never been inside. They would also find duct tape. The roll of duct tape found in his vehicle would also match the piece found at the crime scene. Along with these items, they would find two zip ties, a piece of sheetrock, a metal bracket, a green wrapper, and an empty box of shotgun shells. The empty lot where Hawaii's body was found was discovered to be the location of a building Hiawatha used to work at. It was also discovered that one of his friends owned the lot. The DNA evidence found and collected at the crime scene ultimately turned out to be inconclusive. This was believed to be the result of being exposed to the wet elements from the outside area that caused them to be degraded. In court, Hawatha's defense team argued that the position Hawaii's legs were found in looked like the number seven. And the inverted cross also found next to her body indicated that it was a ritualistic killing done by a member of a cult. This theory was ruled out and ultimately Hawatha Robinson was convicted of his daughter's death and sentenced to 100 years for sodomy and felony murder. What we now know is that on the day eight-year-old Hawaii Robinson was supposed to meet her father, she in fact had a date with the devil. No one could have predicted that her callous murder would be at the hands of her very own father. May she rest in eternal peace.